Capablanca changed the future of chess with this game. And this game played in 1914. He invents the Benko Gambit. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Benko invented the Benko Gambit, and it didn't really be come into play until the 60s, and in the 70s he wrote a book called The Benko Gambit. Well, we'll see in this game that the entire strategy behind that opening was pioneered by Capablanca and played many decades earlier by this chess giant. His opponent, also one of the giants of chess, Aaron Nimzovich, who had the white pieces. Capablanca has black. Let us jump right in. E4, E5, Knight F3. Now, also, the Benko Gambit is a defense against a D-pawn opening, not an E-pawn opening, but watch and see what happens. A knight to c6, knight c3, and knight to f6. We have the four pawns, op excuse me, the four knights opening, which, how could a Benko structure ever emerge from an opening like this? This is just a safe, solid e4, e5 opening. Um, bishop to b5 was played by Nimzovich. You can also play d4, the Scotch four knights. Uh, but this is called the Spanish four knights because you develop the bishop in the same way as you would a Rui Lopez. Um, knight to d4 is the main response these days, probably, or bishop b4, but Capablanca plays d6, a little more common back in those days, but also a little more passive at first sight. Um, it does allow white to get a full pawn center very quickly, and uh, Nimzovich does exactly that. He can play d4 because this knight is pinned and he can't really contest the d4 square. Uh, bishop to d7 is played to relieve the pin on that knight. Um, bishop takes c6. Now, this gives up the bishop pair, uh, but in return, white gets nice control over the center and space in the center of the board. Uh, bishop takes c6, and although at the moment Capablanca is threatening the e4 pawn, I think it's fair to say that Nimzovich, with the white pieces, has won the opening battle up to this point and has gotten everything that he wants, even though, again, black has the bishop pair. Playing d5, just sort of gaining space and hitting that bishop is very tempting, but this would be a mistake. Um, the bishop would just tuck back at d7, and uh, black could consolidate the bishop pair and play for uh, the f5 push and be fine. So instead, uh, queen to d3 was played by Nemzovich to help pre preserve that center. And here Capablanca goes ahead and takes on d4, trying to limit that center a little bit, although white still has the space advantage with the, the pawn. Um, but what Capablanca wants to do, he's opening up these central dark squares, and he wants to find Keto as kingside bishop and place it on that long diagonal. That's his goal here, which he immediately does. Uh, he does play that. He doesn't, he doesn't want to preserve the two bishops here, because after bishop to f4, uh, white is completely developed and one move away from castling, and he's getting a dangerous lead in development here. So he's going to give back that bishop pair uh, so white's lead in development doesn't get out of control. So he plays g6 to place the bishop at g7. Now Nimzovich does go ahead and take that bishop, not only removing the bishop pair advantage, but also damaging the pawn structure now. Uh, black has three pawn islands, and also there's this isolated pawn at a7. The only bonus is that it does keep this knight out of the d5 square, so it does help a little bit in that sense. But Nimzovich immediately goes after the weakest square in the, in the position, the c6 square, that ju was just weakened. Queen to a6 immediately targets that pawn and threatens to take it. So queen to d7 defending, now queen to b7, hitting the rook and the pawn at a7, and rook to c8 is played, and queen to a7. And now, particularly those of you that are familiar with the Benko Gambit, will recognize this structure. And that opening, and that, that concept, basically what Black does is he opens up the A and the B files and places the bishop on the long diagonal. He castles and just attacks on the queen side. And it is a very, very hard opening to deal with. But here it is being played more than 50 years before it became really a known idea and a known opening. Let's see how well Capablanca handles the uh, structure as it emerges here. Uh, bishop to g7, obviously his intention to attack down the diagonal. Castles, castles, and now uh, Capablanca could put some real pressure on e4 here, 
So queen to e6, he needs to get his queen back, Nimzovich does, to re-centralize to help protect that pawn. Rook f to e8, attacking it a second time. Queen to d3, now defending it. Queen to e6, attacking it a third time. And now white goes ahead and plays f3 to defend that pawn, although that does weaken uh, the dark squares a little bit, but it makes the pawn at e4 quite solid. Knight to d7, that does two things. It unblocks the bishop. So now it's putting pressure on this b2 pawn through this knight. And also the knight at d7 can go to e5 or c5 with tempo because it will attack the queen when it lands on either square. Bishop to d2 to help sort of defend that knight a bit. Now knight to e5 hits the queen. Queen to e2 and knight to c4. A very strong square for the knight in this structure. Trying to soften up that b2 square. That's really the point that black wants to soften up. Uh, he's also threatening to take the bishop at d2. And if a white were to play sort of the what seems like to be an obvious move, b3, he actually loses on the spot if he had done that. And here's how. First, bishop to d4 check. The king moves. Knight takes bishop. Queen takes bishop. And then queen to e5 check. That's why you check with the bishop first so that the queen can get behind the bishop. And there's a pin on this knight against this rook at uh, a1, and uh, black wins. He wins decisive material. So to prevent that, Nimzovich plays rook a to b1. He doesn't want to advance those pawns and weaken them. Rook to a8, allowing the other rook to come to the b file. So you have the two rooks going up the a and the b file, coordinating with the bishop at g7. a4, trying to... He, he, he'd love to play an a2 excuse me, c2, b3, a4 structure, but he can't do that at the moment without weakening his dark squares too much. And here Capablanca goes ahead and takes that bishop. He knows that his bishop at g7 is a monster compared to this knight at c3, which has very limited mobility. Notice this pawn at c6, which we talked about earlier, is still controlling these key squares. So the, the, the minor piece comparison, there is no comparison. Capablanca's bishop owns that knight at, uh, at c3. Now he plays his queen to c4, adding to the pressure on white's position. Rook f to d1 and rook e to b8. And basically, Capablanca has every single piece on its ideal square, creating maximum pressure. There's just no way white isn't eventually going to break under this pressure. Queen to e3 is played. Basically, Nimzovich wants to play the rook to d3, so he can defend that knight on c3 and then hopefully play b3, which he's wanted to play, but the knight has been too vulnerable. Rook to b4. Capablanca prepares to double on the b file, putting more pressure on that b2 pawn. And now queen to g5. This is very optimistic from Nimzovich, but he recognizes the situation he's in. Queen to d3, seeking a trade of queens is probably a little bit better, but the end game is still going to be too uncomfortable, too hard for white. So he says, okay, I'm going to see if I can lash out at black's king, maybe play h4, h5, and generate some play in that manner. Um, Capablanca plays a very uh, insightful move, a smart move. Bishop to d4 check. And what he's doing is he's pushing the king to h1. Now the king is vulnerable to potential back rank mating threats, whereas on g1 it, it wasn't. It could move up to, say, f2. Now there are potential back rank problems for that king. Now rook a to b8, doubling against that b pawn, which takes away the defense of the knight on c3. The pressure has gr grown too much. It, there's simply nothing white can do now to avoid the loss of material. The immediate threat, of course, is just bishop takes knight. And when pawn takes bishop, rook takes rook, uh, winning uh, far too much material for, for white to survive. And there's essentially nothing he can do. So he minimizes the damage. He takes the bishop with the rook. He gives up an exchange, but gets rid of that monster bishop, which is more powerful than a rook in this position anyway. Uh, queen takes d4. Now Capablanca has the exchange, although Nimzovich still has that pawn that he gambited for this, this structure. Rook to d1, attacking the queen. Queen goes back to c4. Again, he doesn't want him to consolidate with b3, so he keeps the pressure on the knight. h4, Nimzovich hoping for something. This gets rid of the back rank threats and uh, possibly an h, 
H5, H6 situation, but unlikely. Rook takes B2, gaining that pawn, and now the knight on C3 is undefended, recognizing that there's just no way he's going to generate kingside pressure. He brings the queen back to D2 to defend the C2 pawn. Queen to C5, actually with a nasty little threat here. He's threatening to play rook uh, 8 to B3 and attack that knight, which and the rook cannot be taken because you'd lose the queen. And then the, when the knight moves, he would just play rook takes c2. So that's a very nasty threat here. Um, but rook to e1 is played, and in fact, he could have played that here. Uh, but instead, he plays queen to h5. Why complicate matters when, when you don't have to? He's threatening to take the pawn on h4 with check, of course. The rook goes to a1. If he plays queen to f2 to defend that pawn, then rook takes c2. And then when the queen retakes the rook, Queen takes check, and it's a double attack on the queen and the rook, and uh, black would, of course, win in that position. So Nimzovich has one thing positive in his position, and that is this passed a-pawn. So he places his rook behind it to push it up the board. Queen takes h4 check, king to g1, queen to h5, so he can check and c5 and place the queen on that square. a5 advances, rook to a8. Now, the, what, what black is going to do, he's going to keep attacking that pawn until it moves to a7, and then white won't be able to defend it. So it's attack, so he advances. Queen to c5, check. The king moves. Now queen to c4, attacking it twice again, forcing it to a7, and now queen to c5, and there's really not much he can do to protect that pawn. So Nimzovich has one more attempt to create complications. He plays e5. What he wants to do is to move the knight to e4 and f6, and this rook uh, to a4 and h4 and create some pressure that way. Capablanca is not worried about any of that. He just goes ahead and takes the pawn. The rook goes to a4, so it can shift over to h4, maybe queen h6. Queen to h5 check controls that square so the rook can't get there. King to g1, the queen goes back. King to h2, and he decides that the threats uh, on the king side are nothing to worry about, so Capablanca just advances his pawns in the center. Rook to h4. Now he goes ahead and takes that pawn at a7, not worrying about queen to h6, because if that were played, he could just take the knight after queen h7, just king f8, and this queen controls this h8 square, and uh, Nimzovich would, would have absolutely nothing. Uh, here, Nimzovich plays knight to d1, but before Capablanca could take on c2, Nimzovich resigned. A perfectly executed Benko gambit 50 years before the Benko Gambit was being played at the highest level by the great genius Capablanca. I hope you've enjoyed the game. See you again soon at Chess Dog. Goodbye.